On today's episode, Phi 101, we're going to go back to the basics here, track your spending, figure out how to build that blueprint to financial independence. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is your Friday Roundup. All right, everyone, excited to dive into the building blocks, the blueprint to financial independence. Honestly, you got to you got to build a plan for your life. At some point, you can automate this thing to the degree that you're spending the Brad Barrett less than 10 minutes a month <laughs> on your finances. You will rue the day you said that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, before you get there, you got to first have a plan. And it's hard to have a plan if you have no idea where your money's going. And as common sense as that may sound, I realize that the vast majority of us that are in a perpetual drift state and have been that way for a long period of time because we're able to make it to the next pay period simply have not done so. So this episode is going to have a little bit of everything. We're going to have some action steps to put in place to get a plan for your finances and then a little bit of mindset because at some point, I mean, you really do. You move from building this blueprint to just living a financially independent life and having that lifestyle. And I think while that's the goal for many of us, like the great thing about this conversation is we have both perspectives represented here and we get a chance to lean into that. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing great. Yeah, this is, it, it's interesting, right? That's the beauty of FI is there is something for everybody, just very generally speaking. But also when we're talking about this particular episode, we're going to talk FI 101, but we're also going to talk mindset, right? And and this was especially interesting to me this week personally, because I mean, I guess by any definition, I'm over that FI line, right? And while you have so many choices, it's it's like the paradox of choice. You have so many hours, you have absolute freedom, you have financial resources, but you have to figure out what lights you up in life, right? Like, what do you want your actual life to look like? And I actually Skyped yesterday with uh, my buddy Brandon from The Mad Scientist. And we actually sadly haven't caught up in, in probably nine plus months. So it was, it was good to chat with him. And it's interesting how we've both come to the same conclusion for our own lives. And, and again, this is very, very personal because we know a lot of people who've reached FI who have come to polar opposite conclusions. But, but for us personally, we love our routines. Hmm. Right. Like, it's funny that I've spent this all this time and, and all these years to get to five. And you think there's going to be some drastic change. Right. I think a lot of people intuitively think that. Right. Like, oh, it's just going to be I'm going to travel the world and we're going to do this and do that and have all these new experiences. And, and clearly new experiences are wonderful. But but for me, what I've come to the conclusion is I like my happy little life. Here in Richmond, like it's I know, so simple, it just works, right? Like, <laughs> and that's the crazy thing. Like Laura and I now, especially my parents just moved down, so we actually have a babysitter for the first time in eleven years. Thanks, mom. Yeah, oh, it's it's it is a game changer for us, and it's just so wonderful. Laura and I now have like Friday night date night, and we go out and we just go to a happy hour, right? So of course we can't can't take the uh the fi out of us we we find these amazing deals like all across richmond and you know it's funny actually because i was talking to brandon about this that if jonathan you remember when brandon was on way back in episode 17 i believe yeah we need to have him on again yeah we absolutely do no question and he was talking about how he had lived this life of deprivation right and and he'd actually gone too far over the line for what made a happy life? And then when him and his wife, Jill, decided, okay, we're going to basically go wild, right? We're going to just kind of change our mindset, at least for a short period of time, just to see what it looks like. They only spent a couple thousand dollars extra in an entire calendar year. And yet- Go wild. <laughs> right, like that's, that's wild for them. But yet they, their level of happiness increased dramatically. And, and Laura and I have seen this, not that we're thinking about the dollars and cents necessarily, but we figure if we go out really every Friday, which realistically, when you build in just random plans that you have and travel and all this stuff, if we go out 30 times in a year, it's probably going to be a lot. And we spend $40 each time. That's 1200 bucks, right? And that's 30 of these wonderful experiences at 30 new restaurants in Richmond for 1200 bucks a year, which for me at this point, I'm very fortunate that $1,200 is not, is not a move the needle type scenario. 
It's okay. This is something we're spending out of value and we're getting a ton of value out of it. So it's just kind of cool to build these little things in. And also now Laura and I go to CrossFit together, which is awesome. She started a couple of weeks ago and, and we have our little routine. It's built into the calendar. I don't know if you've seen it yet, Jonathan, but on our Did you Google actually calendar, put it on the choose FI calendar. I didn't yet. I didn't, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. Don't you worry. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 30 AM. We're at CrossFit and call a Sunday, call an audible on Sundays too, right? Yeah. 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 If uh, my mom can come over and babysit, we've got Sunday morning too. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Well, the amazing experiences, right? My family spent this incredible three week vacation in Maui. Uh, choose if I had this just magical experience at FinCon shortly thereafter. I've been traveling to go to these premieres for playing with fire. Like all these things, if you look at them, like there are these peak experiences, but I have to say in getting back from them and we, and we had a six week stretch there where that was pretty much peak experience after peak experience. I'm just happy to be back in my routine. And it's, it's just, it's home, it's comfort. And well, I think there's a little bit of everything in life and, it, and it's cool to have these times where you can experience these peak experiences. I just love my routine. And that's, uh, it's just cool to come to that realization of what do you want your life to look like? And it is very personal. You know, it's interesting. You're, you're speaking of routines and, and the words that are kind of coming to my mind are habits as well. And I've been reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. We're going to be talking with him later on this year. And uh, that book, in a book, actually, we're speaking with the author this next week, David Hauser, wrote this book, Unstoppable. Those two books for me have really helped me evaluate my decision making and have the time to slow down and see, you know, we've talked about this before and we, we've tied it to stuff in the past or spending money like does, did this purchase bring value to your life? If you can just slow down on that and actually verbalize that, why am I buying this? If I buy this, I will have less money. Am I going to get enough enjoyment out of this to justify this purchase? Literally verbalizing that out loud, you can take that same form of decision making and you can apply it to your your health uh, with you know the your food choices that you make and the experiences that you invest in, the things that you throw your life energy at. You can apply this to anything. And Buy and the pursuit of financial independence just gives you the time and the space to do that because it's a life based on value. And what's interesting about saying this, you know, you you have reached and passed the point of financial independence. I'm on the path to financial independence. And I think at a, at a macro level, when you look at it from far, our lives look very similar, in fact, and I think both of us actually crave routine. You were you were talking about the uh, the controlled chaos of the the international nomad, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bryce and Christy Shin lean into that. They love it, man. One bag on their back. They're in a new place every three or four months. They thrive on it. And for me and you, it's it's building that routine into our daily lives that then gives us the small sliver of freedom to explore, but allows us to lean heavily on the routines that we've carved out for you. You get to choose. This is a choose your own adventure. And you're not locked in to a, a nomadic lifestyle or into a suburban lifestyle. You can do whatever you want. But uh, the cool thing is and the important thing is to put a little bit of thought in on the front end to evaluate which financial decisions you're making and then take the bandwidth that that affords you and create the life that you want for yourself. And even in the process, and this is kind of my larger point, you do not have to reach financial independence to start having these conversations, right? I think just getting a little bit of space in your life gives you permission to start slowing down a little bit and thinking about what that's going to look like. And I, I'm excited that over the next you know, five months or so, we're going to have the excuse to really in depth explore what it looks like to apply that decision making framework, obviously to your finances. That's what we're going to do today, but also to your, to your health, to your weight, to your, your, your fitness level, to other lifestyle goals that you may have. You can apply this framework to everything in your life. And when you do it's, it compounds, right? I mean, the benefits are just astronomical. Yeah, they absolutely are. And, and I think it's applying that level of scrutiny to something that, that you might not have otherwise ever looked at, right? I think that's one of the beautiful things of FI is that we, by creating this space, this financial space where you're not in fight or flight mode all the time, worrying about that next paycheck or am I gonna be able to cover the bills, right? As you said, Jonathan, even anywhere along the path, right? Once you have a couple thousand dollars in the bank, your life is dramatically easier. And you create that space where you can step back and actually look at your life and determine what do I want out of this life? And I think that that's really crucially important. I know we've mentioned this many times, but 
we honestly can't mention it enough. It, it gives you that space to step back and just look at life and figure out what is working and what isn't. And I think a lot of this really does come down to habit. And it reminds me of this quote from Tom Bilyeu from Impact Theory, which is one of my all-time favorite podcasts. He said, do and believe that which moves you towards your goal. And that is just such a powerful, powerful thing. And when you're creating an identity, I know I actually think about these quotes. I think about my identity of, as I've said before in this podcast, I'm the type of person that, and I, you know, I implore you to fill in the dot, dot, dot for yourself. I'm the type of person that, and for me, it's does the right thing even when no one else is looking. And I think that has really helped me in my life. Just create this, this framework of what do I want my life to look like, right? I do the right thing even when no one else is looking. And I find that even when I'm, when I'm alone and I could make a poor choice or I could make a positive choice, that quote comes back to me. It really does. And it's astounding. And, and this other one, do and believe that which moves you toward your goal. You know when you're making a decision that's going to help you, right? Like I know fitness is really important for you, Jonathan, right? We've talked about both fitness and nutrition. and I actually think about this now. I, I hear Tom Bilyeu in my head. It's so funny. When I'm, it's three o'clock and my kids are getting home and that's when I have my, usually my second cup of coffee for the day. And it's so easy to pull down the bag of chips. It's so easy, right? They're just there. And I actually now think about that. Do and believe that which moves you towards your goal. Is it moving me toward my goal of being a healthy 90 year old? when I snack on chips every day at three o'clock. No, it's undoubtedly not. So I actually think about that. And, and anyway, enough about me, but I, I'd love to hear like, how is this impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis as you're really learning about this on the fly? Well, let's see. So we're gonna be speaking with David Hauser next week. So I wanna, I wanna like, you some Not of steal some all of, the fun yeah yeah I definitely <laughs> want to tie some of these uh, tie some of these ideas to our roundup next week just because I think we're going to spend a lot of time there but let me just say that speaking on what you were saying identity identity starts with a belief system right and the words that you say either internally or out loud but let's just use out loud just for right now form that belief system. And then your actions usually line up with that, you know, and, and just understanding that I was going back to this book, atomic habits with James clear. There's just, I mean, it's just bomb after bomb after bomb in this thing. But at one point he's using this comparison. He has two individuals, both of them are offered a cigarette. Both of them are former smokers. Both of them are trying to quit. The one person says, I'm trying to quit smoking. The second person says, no, thanks. I'm not a smoker. Now, one of those is someone that is attempting to do something that is against their nature. I'm trying to quit. The other person believes has just become, and, and they may not, they, it may not be internalized yet. Like it's still, but they say, I am not a smoker. They are making an identity statement about themselves and their actions line up with that because because non-smokers don't smoke. If you believe at your core, like that, that is the case, your actions slowly, or maybe not immediately, but your actions are more likely to line up with that. And you can take that maybe obvious example and you can apply that to your health and your fitness. Oh, I'm trying to do better with my diet. Oh, I'm trying to eat clean. Oh, I'm trying to whatever. As opposed to I'm a healthy person. I make healthy choices when it comes to my food. I'm a fit person. I believe that my appearance is important. You know, it's like, it's what is your belief statements that will then over time, your actions will start to align with that. Yeah, and every one of those actions is a vote for that person you wanna be, right? And your brain picks up on this. I'm a healthy person. So every single time you do a healthy thing, it's a vote in favor of that. I, I love that. And literally saying it out loud. Now you can say it privately because it sounds kind of weird. You sit <laughs> on the couch next to your wife. She's like, what'd you say? It's like, oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I did that once. Yeah, time. I was going to say that sounds like I've been there, done that scenario. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> but, it, but, you know, to, your, to the point, when you have just a little bit of space, you can slow down and start thinking about these things and figuring out how your brain is wired and reworking it. You're a compulsive spender. You say this, oh, well, I have a shopping problem. Oh, I have a credit card problem. You have a belief system about yourself. Oh, I'm a bad public speaker. All these little things, you have programmed your brain in certain ways to respond. And when you do that, you don't surprise yourself because you know this is who you are. 
but you've been programming your brain to react that way for years and years and years. And that's what ties it to spending. Oh, well, I, everybody knows I'm not good with money. Where does that come from? Right? Is that a choice? Is that an internal mon monologue that you've been conditioning your brain to accept? And you could change that if you could just take a step back and say, that was a choice to believe that about myself. And going forward, I'm going to believe something different. I'm going to believe a different narrative that I can take small actions, small choices that will align who I believe I am with my future goals. And then every day you get to make small votes in favor of this future self. Yeah, Jonathan, I love how this really comes back right around to finances, right? Because a lot of it starts with mindset. And I think if we're talking about buy 101, it comes back to building that blueprint for what you want your life to look like, right? There's no set path to FI. It is truly a blueprint. And we all need to take that step back and figure out what does that blueprint look like in our own lives? And I think I'd, I'd love to talk about how do we get started with that? So I think for our audience, if we're gonna, if we're gonna do this, yes, this blueprint that I, that I want people that are just finding the show, that I want them to incorporate, um, I think we start with that identity statement, right? Are you here because you feel like you're actually doing pretty good and you're looking for that next thing? Like, do you look at your finances and you're afraid to look, you feel like it's a dumpster fire and you just don't even wanna get near it? What's the, what is the story you tell yourself about yourself with regards to your financial plan? Just take five minutes, you know, maybe over the course of the day and just air that out loud. Who do I think I am? Not just whatever, but who do I think I am when it comes to my money? Allow yourself, give yourself permission to just say the worst, like whatever pops in your mind, what did, what just came into your mind that you just, you know, you, you don't realize that's the internal script that you've been following. And then what would a better version of that look like? Speaking of old scripts, I think this past episode 150 with Diana, she had this script, this really, as when she looks at it now, this utterly absurd script of wanting to be the highest paid female CEO, right? Like there was no there there because she didn't want to lead a company. She didn't want to create something visionary. She just had this status goal. And she said, it was merely status. That's what I was after. It was a hollow goal and a pretty immature goal. And she's moved beyond it now. And I think that's beautiful. It's you have to look at, at these scripts that are running your life, right? Like, why do you think that? And again, this goes back to what I talked about 10 minutes ago, which is having that little bit of space to take a step back and look at your life. And honestly, it's going to change. If, if you had asked me 10 years ago, would, would routine be what I was after in my post-fi life? I would have said, no way. Really? I would have, that would have very much surprised me. I think mm. I would have been looking, I would have told myself it was, it was travel and it was, you know, it's funny, actually, I'm remembering now, even in like episode, like three or four of our podcast, you may be even saying that that was the goal. Yeah. Like I want to travel the world in a hotel with one suitcase. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. You did. Yeah, I did. When I we recording the episode. Said that. And yeah, like that's, it's funny because you're constantly learning about yourself, right? Like in my weird mind's eye two and a half years ago, I probably, I, I certainly said that, right? I want to own nothing. I want to live out of a suit of one backpack basically and, and travel. And that would be my ideal world. And I've come to the conclusion based on really looking at what lights me up. And, and I think that's cool, right? Like I reached five at that point and I still have come to this evolution of where I want to be. And it's going to constantly evolve right? You have seasons of life. And I think that's beautiful. That's part of, of living is determining what is right for me now. What do I think will be right for me? But, but constantly going, going back and just applying what you've learned and determining, is this what I want going forward? And I think that's the beautiful thing is you're not locked in. You're not locked in at all. Right. Like even when you commit to it on a podcast. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, believe me. I mean, you know, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Right. Like we are figuring this out as we go along. This is life. And, you know, it's funny, even my internal monologue of, you know, at this point, I'm 40 years old, but I still feel sometimes like that lost little kid just trying to figure it out. And, and I don't look at that as a negative thing. I look at it as this is part of the human condition. We're always trying to figure it out. And I think that's exciting, personally. You know, it's interesting. Uh, and I think it's probably worth spending some time here. You were talking about um, 
goals a second ago. And I think actually like for audience exploring your goals and, and allowing yourself to vet those as well. Why do you want some, so, so many of us just want stuff, you know, so you could play that. Well, why do you want that? Well, why do you think that is, you know, it's this kind of typical, almost shrink methodology where we're going to get to the core of the motivation that's driving you. And I think with many of the, the goals that I have, like they, it may at first look sound like stuff or a, status or whatever, but usually at the heart of it, if you can get past the many, many different layers, it, it looks a lot like freedom and autonomy, mastery, purpose. It's some of those, you know, things that we've talked about in the, in the past. And it's really important to not stop at that first, what are your goals? And it's also important to not get confused between goals and systems, right? Um, so many of us, we even, we even talk about it. When you're setting your goals, make sure that you follow smart goals, right? And the, there, there's some list of, you know, setting these goals and it meets these different criteria. Again, pulling it back to this book, Habits, uh, Atomic Habits, James Clear, talking about systems and, and saying that while goals, you know, may be necessary, systems are the most important thing in the world that that's really, I mean, if you have your systems in place, the goals are going to come on their own. But if you just go for goals without ever taking the time to internally look at the systems that are allowing you to reach those goals, you're just going to be wandering out there in the wilderness. And so, uh, there's this analogy of the stone chipper, right? The first 100 times that the stone shipper takes that mallet and chisel and applies it to the stone. Nothing happens. There's no, it just looks like they are futile, futile effort, right? Nothing is happening. That 100th and one time, the stone splits in two. And you could say, well, that first 100 times, was that a total abject failure? You know, or was the last one the only one that mattered? Of course, the last one was the least important. It was inevitable that it happened and you couldn't see anything up to that point, but the steps you put in place going into that, that was the process. And that's the thing. A lot of times you don't, you don't see the effort, right? Like, you know, you don't see it with systems. The outside world doesn't see it. You know, it'd be very easy for them to see the, the brand new car, the finance car, the brand new house, the lever, highly leveraged house, all the stuff that you have. That's the stuff that they can see, right? And that's how the outside world in many cases, perceives your level of wealth. But when you're on this path to financial independence, it's the opposite of that. You have built a system for yourself that allows you to achieve this goal, this goal of freedom by creating that space in your life. You're like that craftsman working on the stone. And when you're talking about tracking your spending, literally you could be hitting that mallet for the first time. And it, it doesn't even look like it's going to make a difference. But you know, when you start with this fire one-on-one, when you're building this blueprint, you are creating for yourself a plan that will inevitably lead, even though your neighbors may not see it, any change between today and tomorrow, they may not see any change, you know it's gonna lead to your freedom. That's what this is about. That's what this path to financial independence is about. And it's why, while it's fun to talk about capital gains, harvesting and tax loss, harvesting and backdoor Roth IRAs and all these fun tactics, the system often starts with the simple stuff. And it looks like knowing where your money is going currently so you can make choices to redirect that towards your future goals. Yeah. And I think it really does start from the most elementary point, which is just tracking your expenses, tracking your income, looking at your net worth and getting it on a piece of paper. Right, Jonathan, you would say this is step one for Phi 101 for getting that blueprint is you have to understand where you are today. So if you're new to choose a Phi, if you're new to the Phi movement, and you're trying to figure out what is this all about? I think before, like you said, there are all these advanced tactics and, and they're so sexy, right? And, and they're- Only in the Vi community yeah. would you call any of those tactics <laughs> sexy, but I agree, I agree. <laughs> they certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can't get there right away. You need to just get an understanding of where you are. And for many of you, this will be the first time, right? Because you've stuck your head in the sand Finances are scary, especially when things are not going well, right? It is scary. You don't want to know. You don't want to think about it. So you stick your head in the sand and you just, you hope you can pay the bills that month. And that, that's not good enough for, for the long term. It simply isn't. One of the important factors I look at just in FI is just being honest with yourself, getting to know yourself. We've talked about this the entire episode here, and it's, it's coming to grips with, all right, these are past decisions. I've made them, right? They're not coming back. They are sunk costs. But I can move forward today, tomorrow, and every tomorrow thereafter with 
better decisions that's going to lead to a better life. But I need to be honest with myself today. And I think that starts with put this all on paper. And you can do it however you want. There are technological ways to do this. There's simple Excel, which is what I use. There's a pen and paper, honestly. But you have to get it down. You need to see it in front of you and say, all right, here's where I am today. And what's the plan going forward? And obviously, you're not formulating that plan on day one, but you're certainly starting. And to me, that starting place is just be honest with yourself and put it in front of you. So let's explore that a little bit further. So we talked about getting it down and, and, and regardless of whether it's paper, Excel, Mint, or digital solution, YNAB, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, I actually want to talk, I want to stress why this is so important. I want to use some personal examples, but I want our audience as they're doing this to maybe think about what it looks like right now. Like some people, they know they have like less than 10 recurring monthly structural expenses. And others, like you said, are just afraid to look. And even if at one point you were one of those individuals that only had 10, over time, life happens. And if you haven't done this level of forensics, it's incredibly easy not to. And so it's incredibly important to do this. Now, I know accountants in the room may take this for granted. <laughs> in the room, I wonder who. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about two practical examples that applied to me. So we recently moved uh, from across town, you know, over here. And when that happened, uh, you now for a period of time, you're running everything in duplicate. The uh, person that is not paying attention uh, which would have been myself for a little bit. There was a lot going on with the birth of a child. I did not realize that I was paying double for trash. So I had waste management on this side of town. I'm still covering apparently for the new people that have moved in on the other side of town. By doing a level of forensics, you know, just going through over the last 90 days and just hitting every single bill that hits my account and just tracking it down. You could do it on paper. I was using Mint and YNAB at the time uh, to do this and then comparing that with my, my actual statements. I was able to see that I'm paying duplicate for this, uh, for this county waste. Let me give you another example. This one snuck up on me. So my brother, uh, who's here in the room is about <laughs> and to know chuckling about in the to, background. Yep. So, so he, uh, so he, I let him use my old phone when uh, I got mine replaced and until he could get another one and it was on the fritz. So he knew it was going to have to replace it eventually. And he did. And I was doing this exact process very recently going through. And I suddenly noticed that I was making payments on a phone, on a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, what's going on? And on top of that, I was paying for cell phone insurance. Do you remember that just oh, recently no. me and you talked about how we would never <laughs> pay for cell phone insurance? And I was like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm making cell phone payments and I'm paying $5 a month for protection <laughs> for this $300 phone. So I was like, huh, that's interesting. After doing a little bit of digging, I realized that I was making payments on my brother's phone somehow and that I was also picking up the tab for cell phone insurance for him while also realizing that he was carrying the phone around without a case. <laughs> so I messaged him, Andrew, oh, by the way, you need to Venmo this back to me. I paid off your balance. This is the tab. Feel free to break it up into a couple months if you need to. And um, your cell phone insurance has been canceled by a case. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you that, you know, I, that's, that's, that's an aside. The point It's actually really useful for today's episode in that I'm pretty savvy and I have a pretty good mental list of what we have. I don't have a ton of subscriptions that are recurring because, oh, by the way, in Amazon, we picked up this a la carte package and I'm paying not only for Prime, but also for Stars, also for HBO because that trial, that trial ended. And oh, by the way, we got that Wired magazine because it was a free offer last year, but we had to put in our number and that's recurring and hitting us with $7.99 a month. And oh, by the way, that one payment on that couch that we financed, those payments were supposed to stop, but that's still trail. That's still happening for some reason. You know, like I, what I do at these various stop points when I do go in and analyze it is I'm expecting to have less than 10 recurring monthly expenses. And if there's more than that, because maybe there was a payment on something like I crave simplification. I'm not looking for fancy strategies where I can get 0% interest for the next five years and have an extra $10 a month payment in order to do that. Like if I'm going to pay that off for the sake of simplicity, because when life is chaos, when you have all these payments going out the window, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Yeah, agreed. And I think those insidious monthly payments, right, that they can sneak up on you. They really can. And they do for me as well. I mean, Laura and I actually just canceled Netflix because we just simply weren't using it. We had signed up for Hulu to watch some uh, This Is Us and old seasons of The Amazing Race, uh, which is our new family show. And, and we just weren't using Netflix anymore. So, you know, we canceled it and we could always go back. But it's so easy to just say, 
oh, it's the path of least resistance, right? Let's just leave it. Maybe we'll watch something once a month. But do I really want to pay 13 bucks for a once a month movie? That doesn't make any sense. So you just get a sense of, of where these things are. And for me, and it, like you just mentioned, simplification. I like to have my recurring expenses on one credit card. So whereas if I'm opening a new credit card and I'm trying to hit a minimum spend bonus, I could move all those over. But man, is that a hassle. You know, I can pretty much hit the minimum spending requirement on a travel rewards credit card, even without moving these, these recurring expenses. So I just leave them there. So I can just go back to that one card and look at it and have an at a glance. Ooh. This is all I've got on these card, on this card. So to clarify, and yep. this is great. So you are telling me that with the many different credit cards that you have, yep. you have one that yep. is your utility credit card. Correct. That is absolutely correct. Keeping in mind that there are some, there are some utilities that will charge you. Yes, right. And that, yes, that will charge you a fee. I do not, one of my guiding lights in life, and actually this is funny because I was going to talk the about. fees matter. <laughs> fees matter. And if you're paying a fee, I don't know that I pay any type of fees at all for any banks, okay. yep. credit cards, for convenience fees. If you ever see those kind of things, you really need the alarm bells should be going off of there's probably a better way. I don't pay overdraft fees. I don't pay ATM fees. I'm not paying any of these things. If you see fees, there's usually a better way, especially in the FI community, we found a better way. It, like it's just something as simple as when you're going abroad and you want to take money out of an ATM. Okay, you could just pay the fee like everybody else, or you could open a Charles Schwab checking account and it's free ATM fees anywhere in the world. Just something like that. If you're seeing fees, go to the Choose FI Facebook group and ask a question. Just ask the simple question, hey guys, I'm paying $8 a month in fees on this. What do you do? I think that's the beautiful thing of crowdsourcing is that there are almost always ways around these. And now, obviously there's sometimes where you pay very intentional fees. Like I've talked before, I pay annual fees on one or two credit cards because I've determined, A, I wanna keep a Chase Ultimate Rewards card open so I can always transfer points. So I have a Sapphire Preferred, and that's actually my card that I have all these recurring expenses on, because I know I wanna have that card open. It's very important to me to have the flexibility to take my hundreds of thousands of Chase Ultimate Rewards points and have the flexibility to transfer them out to different transfer partners. And I don't so, wanna get in the weeds here, but yeah. I am very, very curious, two points. So the Chase Sapphire Preferred, you're using this just for you to your utility. So let me ask you for like auto, gas for your car and groceries, are you putting that on the preferred? So, I mean, no, I would say in most cases, we're using our new credit card that we're trying to hit the minimum spend yep. bonus for our normal everyday expenses as I refer to them. So that would be gas, groceries, going out to restaurants, any type of unusual expenses that come up that month, et cetera. Nice. Okay. And that actually could be another card in the Chase ecosystem. Oh yeah. Because since you have the Chase Sapphire Preferred or the Chase Reserve, yeah. it had been that one, you could always yeah. transfer them. You could transfer them over into your ultimate yes. rewards yep. account. That's absolutely true. Or, you know, in our case, we just opened up a Chase Hyatt Visa card and we love Hyatt points. So Laura and I each opened up a Hyatt card and we've been hitting the minimum spend on that. Okay, great. For context, Brad and I both geek out on travel rewards. We talked about it back way back, episode nine of our podcast. It's a great kind of on-ramp to why this gets so exciting for us. And if you want to find out, you know, you want to actually take a class on this, we set up a free class at chooseify.com slash travel. Uh, Brad, second question for you. Talking about avoiding fees, let's say, you know, you're using the Chase uh, Sapphire Preferred for all of your utilities, but some of the utilities may have like a $2.89 processing fee per transaction when you're doing it via credit card, but they will let you set up an ACH direct debit for free. There'll be no charge. In that case, just for your uh -huh. own simplicity, I'm just curious. Do you put all, do you pay it on the Chase Sapphire Preferred? You personally, I don't know if there's necessarily a wrong answer, but in light of avoid the fees, I would imagine that maybe you do something different. Yeah, so I'm avoiding the fee. I would do the the debit directly out of our checking account in that case. Great, okay. So tracking, all right. So let's, let's, let's work through this. So depending on how you get paid, uh, you may get paid weekly, bi-weekly, first and the 15th. Oh, I think I call that bi-monthly, <laughs> monthly, annually. Wow. <laughs> That's intense. All right. But you know, however you get paid, um, assuming most of us get paid at some interval monthly or less, you want to know your income for the month 
one end. And so if it's you and a partner, you know, you want to add in all those various states and that's your inflow. And then as an accountant, you'll want to also know your, your outflow expenses, <laughs> expenses. All right. So you want to know your expenses. And if that number, if your expenses exceed your income, it's pretty obvious, but that's a bad sign. That is, yeah, that is kind of a hair on fire type sign. But I mean, this goes to that little stone chipper idea one more time. When you do that math and you find out that there's a space there, you know, a space between what's coming in after taxes and what's going out, then you're already moving in the right direction. If you had long enough, you know, in an eternity, then even the tiniest little bit of margin would allow you to eventually get to this point. The key, if you want to speed up the point where you're getting to where working is optional, is you need to increase that space. The cool thing is once we have this information, we have maybe three or four paychecks a month, depending on how we get paid. We know how much we have coming in each month. And then now we've gone through this exercise of tracking every single recurring structural expense that we have. We have to then handle the variable expenses, right? Like your groceries and gas and that sort of thing. We want to add in these. So we have these structurals, which are more or less fixed. And then we have these variables, which are high, which are dependent on choices that you make. And at that point, this is where it's really useful to get averages as opposed to just what was it this month? Because really what we want to know is not the cost of your grocery bill, but the cost of your consumption. That's something that you need a couple months. Let's say one month you stock up at Costco and that month you have, you're spending 1200 bucks. Oh my goodness. But then the next month you eat, you just eat everything that you purchased in Costco because at Costco, it's impossible to purchase less than a six week supply. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we need a way to average that out. So I feel like three months of running this exercise, one month gives you 80% of the data, but really in order to make sure that your numbers make sense, you, you're going to want three months and three months is what I think allows you to project out and say, all right, so over three months we spent this. So our annual expenses likely are this. Yeah, Jonathan, that is a good point. But I would say, like you said in there, the 80, 20, right? Looking at one month for many people out there, if this is your first time doing this, this is going to be overwhelming. Mm. So when you hear, oh, get a three month average and then project out and do all this other stuff that might get you a little bit nervous. I would say, just look at this last month. You can get a sense of roughly if this is a normal month, right? Did you, did you go to Costco and have that extraordinary expense? All right. Then you can pretty much assuredly say, that's not going to be my grocery bill for this coming month or all future months, but just get a sense of where you are. I think what Jonathan said is exactly spot on. Three months would be a wonderful average and would enable you to look forward and say, all right, this is roughly what my monthly expense is going to be for groceries and such. But if you want to just look at that one month, if that's going to make you move forward, then do that. And that's sufficient. I would even say you, to simplify that further, you could build a system that would autopilot those second and third months for the most part. So that first month you're having to do massive amount, you're doing forensics, right? You're going to all your accounts, you're consolidating things, you're coming up with a plan, you're putting it on paper, you're putting it on Excel, you're using Mint or YNAB, you know, one of these plans. And then month two and three, especially if you're using one of these digital solutions, you're just looking for the cracks. You're looking for where it didn't work or what you needed to add to make your reporting more accurate. Um, and so really, again, it comes down to that first month, that choice that for the next 30 days, uh, we're going to find out what our life actually costs. And then this is where it gets kind of cool. Once you have like, this is just what it is. You can start bending your budget to your will. Like, and I use the word budget very loosely here. This is not telling you on month one. This is not telling you that you need to go into deprivation and not spend anything. You literally just want to know where your money is going. It is a form of just saying, here's where we are without judgment. Here's where we are. Month two and three, are you leaning into it and saying, this is where I want my money to go and making sure that this new system works for yourself. And so I, when I break my budget down, I'm breaking it down a couple different ways. I'm breaking down my structural expenses. So as the provider for my family, I want to know how much my life, how much of my response, I need to make sure that my family always has this minimum amount in order to cover the obligations that we have committed to. Past that point in time, there is the stuff that generally makes life more comfortable. You can call it whatever you want. This could be the fluff part of your budget. This could be the cush. Could be what, I don't know. I pick a different word for it. I don't have the, I don't have the term yet. I will by next week. But uh, at, at that point, we're, we're wanting to know like, Aside from these 10 recurring monthly expenses that covers our house and our groceries and our gas and our whatever else, it's the small stuff. It's the, it's the saving for Christmas. It's the 
presents for friends and family. It's the entertainment budget. You don't need Netflix, Amazon Prime or whatever, whatever. Like you can, you, these are luxuries that you have built into your life based on, you know, a decision that you made. I love, like you said, Brad, you can reevaluate those. Literally the only thing keeping us on Netflix right now is my son's watching Llama Llama. <laughs> I'm currently evaluating whether or not that is worth it to hold on. They say they're bringing back Seinfeld next year. We'll have to see. But right now it's being used for Llama Llama. It doesn't really seem like a good ROI at that particular point in time. All right, we'll come back to that one. But anyways, you're allowed to say, wow, I am paying, you know, $60, $70 plus my cable bill to various forms of entertainment and our family, like we just never watch it. We don't have any time. There's nothing, you know, why, why are we spending this much? Now you get to start a line that figure out, well, where would I want that money to go? And you could start testing and iterating this and you could kind of see, oh, wow, we're increasing that space. And, and this is pretty cool. This goes to, uh, this goes to something you were talking about last week. Do the small things matter? Well, stone chipper. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yes. But then also every hundred dollars a month that you can carve from monthly recurring expenses that you chop from your budget, that's $30,000 less that you need to reach this financial independence number. And there's many variants of that. I mean, you can target this in plenty of different ways, but, and we'll come back to those. We'll talk about those big multipliers again, but I think this is such a fascinating experiment. If you haven't had the opportunity, it's really, it's, it can be very fun to do this. Just evaluate. If you think about your money, your income is your life energy. It represents time that you have to show up at a job that you may or may not like. Where is that life energy going? What are you putting it back into? Is it bringing value to your life? Yeah, that is a great way of putting it in. And I love that stat right? It's do the little things matter? They assuredly do, right? $100 per month that you cut out of your budget is $30,000 less that you need in your net worth to reach FI. That matters, right? So clearly we're going to talk in many multiple parts here of, of FI 101, certainly diving into these weeds of how do you move forward? How do you make value decisions? But clearly for this first step, it's get it on paper. And I think just the second part of this real quick is list your assets, right? Get a net worth statement for the first time, maybe ever in your life. Just look at all your accounts. What do I own? And just put them on a sheet of paper. And then what are my liabilities? What are the actual amounts that I owe in my total student loans, in my credit cards, in whatever other consumer debt you have, in mortgages? Just put them on a sheet of paper so you have a sense of what is out there. Just consolidate it and just get a sense of what, what do I owe and what do I own? And I think this is a really powerful exercise. So this to me is the first step of the blueprint to financial independence. All right. Well, let's go ahead and bring MK into this conversation, bring in some, uh, some feedback from the community. How you doing? Hey guys, I'm doing great. So really excited Quite to well. bring you some, <laughs> that's not my line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we have some really great feedback uh, from the community. So first I'll go over feedback and then I'll go over some really great wins that we got. So Paul wrote in after listening to the roundup last week where we talked about the really long lasting cars and you know, keeping them as long as possible and not being drawn in by the shiny new car syndrome that so many of us get. So Paul actually wrote in uh, with some feedback on that. So he said, wanted to drop a line in regards to the other listener that sent in the praise for her 1992 Civic. While this is awesome that her beloved car has made it this far, we all too often place the economics so heavily on the forefront of the discussion that we lose sight of one of the biggest grouping of technological innovations to happen to cars that make it worth it to buy a newer car or more expensive car. And those are all the safety advances we've seen hit the past couple of decades uh, particularly in just the past few years. So often we feel compelled to drive a car till the wheels fall off, hopefully not literally. And on various forums and blogs, I see people always advise to get a beater for cash. While this makes sense economically, it doesn't from the standpoint of safety. A car built in 2000 may have gotten really good safety rating. Most would not really pass those tests today. The least safe car today is probably safer than the most safe car from the mid 90s. Geo Metro for the win? 
<laughs> well, he calls out a specific one. So he says, I know a listener with a 95 Volvo 850 is going to take offense to that notion. But the fact stands that those cars didn't have anywhere near the safety features as those of today. This is not just electronic wizardry, like stability control or automatic braking or lane departure warning correction. It's all sorts of things we don't see, like the high strength steel components placed strategically to direct forces into the purposely designed crumple zones away from the passenger compartment or the engine subframe specifically designed to break away and allow the engine to go under the car instead of crashing the firewall and intruding into the cabin. There are also the multitude of airbags that pad from nearly all directions. Then there is the wear and tear that just plain ages uh, places on the car. So rubber bits and the suspension wear out and can cause the car to act erratic and evas- in evasive maneuvers. Rust in the unibody can create a greatly weakened structure. Components like brake calipers ha- can have erosion that reduces their performance quality. All of these things happen slowly, so you don't notice them over time, but in a situation could cause the car to perform very poorly. So Paul is really going into detail here about, while well, yes, um, it is good to drive our cars as long as possible and not just you know, get into the habit of buy the new car, lease the new car every few years. There are a lot of really great safety features that are out. So maybe even getting the car that's uh, one model year older, two model years older that has these great safety features can have a long term uh, positive effect for you. So I thought that was a really great disclaimer that Paul put in there to not always uh, place all the emphasis on just getting the cheapest car possible. You want the best value car. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to regret saying this. I can feel it. But I, when, when Paul started, I was, or when we were starting to read it, I was, I wasn't, I was, I'm not going to say I was going to write it off. I wasn't going to write it off. That's not, that's not fair. But I, I, by the end of this message, like he is making fantastic points, fantastic points. And there is a fine line. I mean, I think, I mean, you can make the safest car in the world for 200 K. I mean, you know, like I, let's, but there, but to his point, the case that you made was not go buy a 20 year old car, you know? It, it was buy a safe, reliable car and drive it forever. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and obviously we all have to look at our own lives and determine what we value. To your point, we could drive a tank down, down Main Street, right? And that would cost a couple million bucks and obviously we'd be safe, but that's not real life, right? So I think we all need, and it, it gets especially emotional, right? When you're talking about your safety. So clearly, That is hard to put a price on. But for me, I drive about two to 3,000 miles a year. And I look at what are the components of safety for my car. And to me, the vast majority of it is the braking system. So I felt recently, actually, that the brakes were not operating as optimally as they could. So I took them into the shop and I had the entire system looked at and brake pads and rotors replaced. And, you know, that was certainly a couple hundred dollars, but that was well worth the money, right? Did I need them at that moment? No, I definitely did not. But that was something that I placed value on because even in the one mile back and forth to the swim club that I take my daughters to four times a week, I want to make sure the car operates safely, obviously. But do I need all these additional features like the lane assist and the auto braking Probably not for my mile trip. So that's what I've looked at. You have, let's face it. At this point, you have an oversized go-kart. No. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but I do think that there, there's an individual that probably has a seatbelt that's being held on by like a coat hanger at this point, you know, and they were able to sneak it by safety inspection. No, 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 my friends, let's not do this. I think Paul's making a fantastic yep. point that there is a, a line at which you, your safety does matter. You know, what is the point of all the money in the world if you're not alive to use it? Uh, so, uh, but, but, I, but you can get a very safe, reliable car for less than 10 grand. It, it, it is possible to do it all. And then in that case, now the better question is, well, what are those cars? Right. And what steps do I need to take to make sure that, um, I'm not getting a lemon. That's the more concerning part. When you're talking about buying a used vehicle, the great thing about buying a modest new vehicle you know, not the $40,000 car, but the sub twenties, you know, they're in the 15 to $20,000 range that, you know, is, is a great car. If you do that, at least, you know, the owner, you know, what the car has been through, you know, that you've gotten the oil change, you've gotten the brake inspect, like all these various things. You have a lot of information when you're buying a used car, you don't have as much. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that the questions you need to ask are different. Um, my, my brother's done pretty well buying used cars. And I think he's driving a relatively new Volvo as it happens right now. And he got it for 
far less than 10 K far, far less. And I'm sure that it's going to last longer than any of the cars that I've ever purchased because he kind of went through this process, have a mechanic, look at it, know what to look for. When you look in the oil, do you see the metal shavings inside the oil that tells you that there's something wrong with the engine block? You know, I'm using words that I don't really understand. <laughs> it's probably coming through, but at the same point, if you're going to purchase a new car, there's probably a ask a better question, get a better answer. There's a list of questions that you can work through to make sure that you get a reasonable price when you're, and, and that depreciation curve is brutal. There are so many people on the other side of this that they got the safe car, but then just a couple months later, a couple years later, had buyer's regret, wanted to upgrade it, wanted to change it. And their car is worth less than they owe on it. Don't be that person. Brad, when, uh, when Laura, when Laura upgraded her car, she did not go ahead and get a new car. Um, she got one that had already gone through the depreciation curve and is a wonderfully, probably one of the safest cars on the market right now. And it's working great for you and your family. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, we had pretty much reached the end of the line with the 03 Highlander. And this was just a handful of months ago at this point. And what we did was we didn't buy a 2019 or 2018 Highlander. We bought a 2013 and it was less than half the price of a brand new Highlander. And the thing is wonderful. I mean, it's so funny when you have lower expectations, when you're used to driving two 2003 cars, a 2013 is like the lap of luxury. It's amazing. So yeah, we're all thrilled. When I see a brand new car on the market that I'm that I'm loving, you know, I'm like, I'll see you in five years. <laughs> <laughs> and oh man, my kids were hilarious. They they walked into the car the first time and they're like, it smells so nice in here. <laughs> it's not a 15 year old car. So yeah, that was just kind of funny. We got a message from uh, JD Roth. He was at Chautauqua uh, this, this just a couple weeks ago at this point. And uh, he was messaging us. They were doing some sort of trivia and they were saying, who has a nicer car, uh, Brad and Jonathan. And I realized in that moment that, I mean, honestly, I don't know why I didn't put it together, but you're driving a 2003 Honda Civic and I'm driving a 1998 Ford Expedition right now. I was like, Oh my goodness, Brad at some <laughs> level may have the nicer car. He's living the life of luxury right now. Golden boy for the win. <laughs> I like it. You know what? But I tell you what, my 1998 Ford Expedition that I got for a thousand dollars, that thing has 150,000 miles on it and it's going to last forever. And when it needs to be fixed or replaced, it's going to be super easy. It's pr it is a tank. It's probably a tank on the roads. And it makes me so happy. Like I, when I was a kid, I always wanted to have that truck. And I think even in high school, I was visualizing I was going to have that truck with like the lifted wheels or something else. And I even thought at some point when I was a slightly more mature version of myself that I was going to have the new truck that was the fifty to sixty thousand dollar truck. At some point, I visualized that literally having this thousand dollar vehicle has probably saved me in present day dollars. 40 to $50,000 of car payments. This is a great phrase that we actually learned from, um, that we learned from the happy philosopher, Jeff, the, Jeff, the happy philosopher. He is a physician and he was, and in this episode, he was talking about the marginal utility of a fork. And when it comes to a fork, this is a silly example, but maybe you can follow me on this. You could spend, you could get a fork for free at the thrift store. You could pay two or $3 for a set at Target or Walmart. You could spend 50 to 60 bucks at Crate and Barrel. You could spend thousands of dollars on a pure gold set of forks. But at the end of the day, it just takes the food off your plate and puts it in your mouth. And you imbue these vehicles with so much additional meaning, meaning on your status, meaning on like how people relate to you. If you imbue this vehicle with all these other things, that this is my identity, it's probably gonna cost you a lot of money, but it really doesn't have to. It's a utility. It's a, you know, it, it gets you from A to B. And to have payments on something that's getting you, you know, from A to B, where B is a job that you barely tolerate, but you have to do to be able to afford the payments is a really bad trade-off. And it's worth evaluating that and saying, well, what can I do about that? You know, how do I fix this equation? And, and, you know, talking about, you know, the marginal utility, Brad, this also goes back to your goals with Diana in this past week's episode, this goal of being the world's highest paid female CEO, you know, it's, it's truly like to what to what end, you know, if your if your goal is just that, but why that, if at the end of it, you realize it is the freedom that that might afford, is there something that would consume less of you to get that? There are so many paths to get the freedom that is afforded by this goal that really you've just bought into someone else's vision. Uh, actually, MK, I'm curious on your thoughts on this. Yeah, it was interesting. And it was, I thought it was really great that she said that it was all about status. You know, when she was growing up, she was told, you know, work hard in school, go to a good college, get a good job to get the status. And I thought it was really great that she owned that to say, yeah, that was an immature goal because it was all about getting status. It wasn't about what that would bring me, which is the financial freedom and having a successful business that helps people. It was just about status. And when you think about 
people identify that with having the brand new car is a status symbol. And I know in my own experience, like my past job, I had a cool job. I was very married to the status and the cool factor of that job. Uh, knowing I was going to be leaving, planning for that, the most work I had to do in preparing to leave that job was learning to not introduce myself as working for that company and getting the status reaction of like, oh, that's so cool. Tell me all about that. It was learning to introduce myself as, hey, I'm an author. Hey, I am you know, an entrepreneur because there are so many people who can say that. And I knew I was losing the status. So I really related to when Diana talked about the status because that was my own experience as well. And I think we all have those moments where the goal that's tied to status never works out well. But if it's the goal that's tied to what's behind it, that can sometimes work better. So if the goal is to have a the most efficient car on the road, that's the safest, that's that's what you want, not I want the new shiny toy. Or if the goal is I want to be a full-time entrepreneur, I want to be FI, so I don't have to worry about the financial aspect of taking that leap for a while. That's better than, oh, but I have this really cool title at this really cool job. Um, so I I really related to that. Yeah. I mean, that is, is all this external, right? Like, oh, will people validate me because I work for this company or whatever it may be, or I look rich by driving this car. It's all about the internal state. And I think this is where we started the episode. And it just comes back to, to me at least, the most important thing is, what do I think about myself when I'm alone and by myself, right? Do I think I'm less than, or have I worked to a place where I'm content and happy with, like you said, having a glorified go-kart as a car? Like, <laughs> I would never even think about that. I still refer to my car as this like lovely little car. And then like, it's, it's, it's a piece nice. of junk, right? But, <laughs> but, but I could care less because it's about my internal state. It's about the work that I've put in over the last, honestly, 10 years to just live a better life as I see fit. It's all about what you want your life to look like. It's not about somebody else. Just don't care about that. That's, that's my biggest piece of advice for every single person listening is just don't care what other people think. That will not give you long-term happiness. It just simply will not. Mm -hmm. And that's a lesson I feel like we're all learning all the time right? Like you learn it once and then you have to learn it again and learn it again. So that's always a great reminder to people. And the last thing I wanted to do, uh, Brad, is, is actually come back to, I think I've, I've just because of the nature of what I've been reading with these, this series of books, I've kind of I'm calling out goal setting, right? As something, uh, but you can't invalidate it completely. Like that's the big idea. You just need to realize that the goal is less important to the systems that are placed. I only say that to say that in Diana's episode, she talked about this big audacious goal. Today, what we've talked about is maybe the systems that would be behind correcting that. But man, goals, I mean, goals do have a place in this world. Yeah, I mean, goals set direction. But the goal is not the be all end all, in my estimation. It's the little changes you make on a daily basis to set up those systems that will get you to goals, right? Whether it be that one individual goal or the next goal or whatever it is beyond the rainbow, right? The goals to me are not as important as setting up these daily habits, these daily systems that make for a better life. So I agree. And the funny thing actually is James Clear mentioned in his book, Atomic Habits, that he first learned about this from Scott Adams, who, <laughs> and it's from that same book where we got the talent stack, which is called How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And this is really, it's a brilliant book because he specifically talks about goals versus systems and he talks about the talent stack. So it's funny how this has become part of the vernacular now for choose a FI and really, I guess, the FI movement. Yeah. And it's also interesting to see how James Clear, when he's talking about habits, also ends up talking about finances as well. You can't separate these two. When you're talking about life optimization, it's, it's, it's a framework for decision making and it's figuring out what to put on autopilot to give yourself more space to focus on what moves you forward. And that actually teased me up. This upcoming Monday, we're speaking with David Hauser. He wrote a book called Unstoppable. And it's a book that talks about his journey using the example of changes that he made with his diet. But even more than that, it gives you a framework through thinking through the decisions that you've actually made and evaluating whether or not that is actually moving you forward. It's an incredible episode. We talk on everything from entrepreneurship to health and wellness. And we'll be speaking with David on Monday. 
All right. Well, unfortunately, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. We are giving away our book right now. Choose FI, Your Blueprint to Financial Independence. Very apt for the conversation today. If you want to win a copy, all you need to do is just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. By the way, a little parenthetical there. Apparently, uh, iTunes, finally, they've been telling us that forever they were going to be nuking iTunes and moving to Apple Music and Apple Podcasts. Apparently, with this latest release, they have done so. I may need to tweak that uh, little you know, iTunes part again. But right now, go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Follow the instructions there. Leave us a short written review. Send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce a winner on the Friday round up. So uh, MK, how many winners do we have today? Well, this week we have one winner and this review comes from Isaac. So Isaac writes, fantastic motivation. Choose a Fi was my first real introduction to the Fi community and hearing the stories of everyday people making it to financial independence in a short time has motivated me to start taking my savings rate seriously. I'm happy to announce that two months and 40 episodes of Choose a Fi has brought my savings rate from around 10% to just under 50%. Keep up wow. the good work. And I'll say, Isaac, you keep up the good work. That's awesome. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that is incredible. All right, my friends, you made it to the end on YouTube. You know, that means you deserve it. You get to see the Friday happy dance. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You know, hit that subscribe button, press that bell. It's a YouTube notification, tells YouTube to let you know next time we have additional content. <laughs> MK, I was doing it with you, but I don't think I was on the camera, so yeah. There we go. I don't know if anybody actually presses subscribe after I do this dance. It probably talks them out of, what are your hands doing? They just, they just keep going higher. <laughs> <laughs> or was it, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> just put your hands down, dude. Just put your hands down. It's all good. Oh, real quick, extra bonus material for people here. Uh, so board games, uh, we, you see some on the back shelf that we highlight occasionally. I'll pop one of them up here, but uh, let me go grab it. Brad just asked me to, to re-borrow two games I'm going to pop these on the shelf here and he can tell you why. Give me just a second. All right. So I've got it here. These are the two games. Uh, we were introduced to these games by David Gardner with Motley Fool, and he taught us how to play them, and um, which is great because I already owned it, but I didn't know how to play. And it's an amazing game. And Brad immediately asked to borrow it to play with his family. They did so. And then just today, he asked me to re-borrow it. So Brad, I feel like if you're asking to re-borrow yeah. something, that means that you can provide a review. Yeah, this was cool. Uh, our kids, actually, they actually asked Laura, hey, mommy, can we play Seven Wonders again? And Laura had to tell them, that's Jonathan's game. Daddy will have to go ask him to borrow it again. So yeah, when we played this with uh, with David up at Motley Fool headquarters, he is first off like the best game master. World's of greatest all time. game master. Yeah. Cannot take anything <laughs> away from that is an art form in and of itself. Yeah, Seven Wonders is a complicated game, but once you get into it, it is super exciting. And uh, yeah, there's actually this two person version over here, which is called Seven Wonders Duel. So Laura and I intend on playing that and the family, the four of us, and my kids can play this, even though it really, theoretically, you would think when you first play it, it's for adults, because it is rather complex. Uh, it's just, there's a lot of strategy in it. Uh, Jonathan, you're probably better at explaining it than I am. Yeah, I mean, if, ooh, I wish I could do a breakdown, but, but effectively, um, every person gets an interactive experience. The cool thing about it is every person is playing the entire time. You don't really have downtime. Uh, which is really cool. And it scales up and down really nicely. This two person game, I haven't played, but the, 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 this one goes from the, the larger one goes from two to seven. The other one dual is just intended for two people. What's incredible. There's very few games that scale up quite as they like, they play really well at two people or four people. But then when you take advantage of the range, they kind of fall apart. This one will play just as well at seven people as it does the two, because you're not waiting for person a to go before, you know, person one to go before person seven can go and, and, and so on. Everybody is playing the entire time. Beautiful cards that actually happen. It kind of tells a cool story. You can start to look for patterns. Every single game is just slightly different. You can go and there's multiple strategies and all of them are winning strategies. You know how with like Mario Kart back in the day, you would play with one you knew you're going to lose if you didn't get this character. Like nobody's winning with that character. You can win with all of the different strategies, depending on whether or not you can pick out, you know, the the playbook for each 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 process. Uh, it is a genuinely fun game to play. And I'm excited that you guys are picking it back up. So. Maybe uh, we can use uh, the YouTube channel as an opportunity to, to highlight a few of the different games periodically. I don't know. 
you let us know. If you enjoyed this, if you want to see more of that, just let us know. We can we can pick a couple more up. I will show you at some point the game closet. <laughs> <laughs> be afraid. Be very well, afraid. Well, it's not David Gardner level like that. That is at a, a level, you know, all in and of itself. But um, for for it's, it's pretty, it, it's decently impressive yeah. for not being a board game channel. It's a decently impressive uh, closet. So. <laughs> all right. Real this time, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.